I am very happy to see such a full room for this panel. We will aim to talk about hosted control planes and how we can revolutionize the control plane within Kubernetes. Now, we have a wide, very wide audience. Um, before we start, I would like to ask the audience, how many of you have heard about hosted control planes? Right, that's amazing. How many of you are using this in production at the moment? Oh, I can see some hands, perfect. Um, so before we're gonna start, I would like to introduce myself and of course my panel. My name is Katie Gamanji and currently I am a senior field engineer at Apple. As well, in addition to that, I am one of the TUC or Technical Oversight Committee member for CNCF. Today we have a wonderful panel with experts within this area that will share their wisdom and their experience with hosted control planes. And I would like to ask them to introduce themselves. So perhaps let's start with you, Taylor, and we're just gonna go around. Hey everyone, just super grateful for y'all's time today. Uh, my name is Tara Lasowski. I'm the lead architect of IBM Cloud Satellite and work um, on the delivery of our managed services um, on-premise and in multi-cloud environments. Um, super excited to speak with y'all today. Hey, I'm Yussi from Mirantis. Um, one of the things that I'm working on at Mirantis is our k 0 cube distro and the accompanying implementation of hosted control planes called Cosmotron. Hi, everyone. So my name is Adriano. I'm the founder of Classics, uh, a company that started to investigate the hosted control plane uh, model from the beginning, from 2020, more or less. And uh, we, in 2022, we uh, released uh, uh, our uh, implementation of the hosted control plane that is called Kamaji. It's uh, open source and uh, uh, quite uh, robust and production ready. Thank you. And hello, uh, I am Cesar Wong. I'm an engineer at Red Hat. I've been working on hosted control planes for about five years, which it's a very long time for me. Uh, most recently, I am working on the Hypershift project, um, which is an implementation of hosted control planes for OpenShift. Um, and I'm super glad to be here. Amazing. Now, as we have seen, sorry, uh, some of you are familiar with hosted control planes and the notion of it. Some of you are running it in production. However, for the interest of being declarative into explaining this terminology and what it actually means, I would like to ask Adriano to explain what hosted control planes are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, the hosted control plane is a design pattern, is a new design pattern for a Kubernetes architecture. Uh, well, you have two layers. Uh, you have the downstream layers where the tenant cluster are placed, and then you have an upper layer where the the management cluster is placed. The hosted control plane, the control plane of the downstream cluster are hosted into the management layer and they run as a regular uh, Kubernetes application managed by the uh, Kubernetes in the management layer. So uh, this is, a, uh, is not quite new uh, design because uh, every Every of us are using uh, managed Kubernetes services from the hyperscalers. And so uh, this design pattern is coming from the hyperscaler. The management, uh, the managed uh, Kubernetes service, most of the, uh, this uh, uh, service that we use every day uh, are based on the hosted control plane model. Um, I don't know if you want to add some more other details or perspective to I think that's pretty much a good introduction. So we're aiming to run our control planes as pods within our Kubernetes clusters. Now, the natural question after that is why and where exactly can we apply these particular scenarios? So I'd like to ask perhaps JC to share more about that. All right. Uh, quite early on with our K0 distro, we, we kind of saw needs for something like this in typical use cases like, for, for example, edge networks. Um, on edge, you push your workloads towards the end of the, the edge of the network where you probably either cannot run or don't want to run the control planes. 
So we want to run it somewhere central. Uh, another kind of similar common use case that we've seen and, and heard about is, is industrial automation. On factories, well, factories are run by IT probably like 100% nowadays. So, and, and, and uh, we want to push the workloads closer and closer to the actual manufacturing process. So think about things like, like PLC controllers running within the actual machinery. So we want to push Kubernetes workloads there. And those are like super, super tiny devices where you, you know, you just cannot run API server, etcd, and all that resource hogging machinery there. So again, we have to have some central way to manage all the control planes for these kind of smaller, more and more distributed clusters. And hence, well, if you, if you ha have to have something central, why not use Kubernetes for that? That's why we are all, all here anyway. Yeah, yeah and so um, for us, the primary use case is for a managed service, right? And managed service providers. So managed service providers need a way to provide clusters to their customers and prevent their customers from messing with the cluster, right? Um, and so um, uh, the hosted control planes give you a separation of concerns, right? The control plane pieces live in the provider's infrastructure and they are not visible to the customer, right? What is visible to the customer is a cube API endpoint. And so there's no uh, pods running control plane workloads that the customer can see uh, or that they can delete. There's no infrastructure that they can see. It's all uh, managed by the service provider. Right, so that is a huge advantage. Um, the other one is that uh, because you are running control planes in your infrastructure, you can bin pack control planes into nodes and um, size them appropriately, right? So uh, some customers may want to use a lot, like big, require big API servers. Uh, it is very easy to vertically scale your control plane uh, when you're running it as bots in your infrastructure. Um, and of course, deploying uh, control planes or provisioning control planes is very easy, right? You have existing infrastructure, and when you say, I want a new hosted cluster, uh, a new control plane, all you're doing is running a set of pods in a namespace, and that's it. You have a cluster, right? So um, it is reliable, it is cheaper, and it is faster. Right. You make it sound all that simple. You just run pods. <laughs> yes, you run pods. Yeah. So talking about running pods, Let's look into the current ecosystem and tools that will help us to leverage the hosted control plane initiative. Now, usually when I mentioned that, and I had actually people approaching me, when we're talking about hosted control planes, the first interaction or reference they have in their mind is cluster API, perhaps, and KCP. And I would like to ask Taylor, perhaps, to describe the relationship between hosted control planes and some of this tooling, and perhaps focus on or showcasing some of the new tooling or new initiatives that are focused on hosted control planes at the moment? Yeah, excellent question, Katie. So really how I view the difference, you know, when you look at cluster API and hosted control planes, I view hosted control planes almost the methodology, right? This notion of running a Kubernetes control plane in a separate network, in a separate environment, management environment, um, as a Kubernetes native services, right? Pods, services, et cetera almost as a methodology. And then there's the engines to actually deliver that methodology. So that if you look at cluster API, right, those are going to be your tool sets and your drivers where you can give it declarative information to say, hey, I want to run a hosted control plane. You go out and if you have a connection into, you know, this special management network and this data plane, go provision me my worker nodes in my data plane, go provision me a um, Kubernetes control plane in my management plane. 
So that's sort of how I conceptualize the relationship of the two. Um, talking further on community initiatives that are ongoing right now, one thing that we've noticed um, that we've started to hit, especially with the networking perspective of these control plane to data plane workflows. So think about your API services, your admission webhooks. Today, from the early days, it's still sort of this all or nothing concept to where when you talk about a group of an admission webhooks or an API server, it's either it all goes into the data plane network or it all stays in the control plane network. And what we really want to drive in the community is get finer grain control over that on a source to destination basis to enable an operator to say, hey, I have these set of emission endpoints in my control plane network. Let me keep those there. But then this set that my customer is providing, I want those to go into the cluster. So that's one initiative that we're working on. The second initiative that I would say we're working on is we always see that storing the data is hard. Operating etcd is probably one of the most difficult parts of this hosted control plane piece, right? So what we really wanted to, um, what we're working to revitalize and get in the community is a best of breed um, etcd operator that is tailor focused on the purpose of provisioning etcd for Kubernetes clusters, right? For that purpose. And all the sort of excellence around, you know, fault tolerance and recovery, automatic provisioning, automatic upgrades of, um, you know, those clusters. So that's a second piece that we're looking to drive in the community. Perfect. Anyone else would like to mention some of the internal toolings that they have or some of the open source tooling that they use internally for HPC? Uh, at, at least uh, my team, what we're working on with this, our open source Cosmotron, uh, it is actually already a, a fully conformant cluster API provider running the control planes as pods. And I know Adriana's team is also working on Yeah, on yeah. That. We also are working on a cluster API integration uh, in order to have the control plane created in a declarative way according to the uh, cluster API uh, approach. And uh, so we, we support uh, almost all the uh, uh, infrastructure providers that are supported by uh, uh, cluster API. And I did want to mention that in our solution, we do rely on cluster API for our machine provisioning. Um, and, and you know, are looking to have a closer integration there. But that's not the only project that we rely on, right? Like, we use connectivity, uh, which is a community project uh, for, I, and all of us use it. That, that is the solution to yeah. connect to workers, right? Um, and we were talking a little bit about etcd, right? Like managing etcd. It'd be great if we had a community operator to let us manage etcd. So there's definitely um, several things that we can collaborate in the community. Perfect. So at this stage, we definitely have the benefit of using HCP at the edge for the managed service providers. So now let's look into some of the challenges or perhaps some misconception of perspective. So one of the things that I was always wondering when it comes to hosted control planes is how disaster recovery is actually gonna happen because of course we're gonna have one cluster that's gonna host all of our control planes that might be perceived as a single point of failure. So here perhaps I'd like to have Jason Caesar challenging this point of view. Yeah, so this is very common, right? Like once we explain to people what hosted control planes are, the very first question or concern is, well, now you're running all your clusters or your control planes on a management cluster. What happens if that management cluster goes down, right? Like, am I dead in the water, not just with one cluster, but now potentially hundreds of clusters, right? And uh, the answer to that is, well, for one uh, cluster, the control plane workloads are very similar or are like any other business critical workload that you're running. So if you're worried about control planes, you're, I mean, you, I'm sure you have other business workloads that you run and what do you do to keep those available, right? Like you, you use things like uh, HA replication, you use, uh, you know, frequent backups, uh, those sort of things 
they apply to control planes as well, right? Um, the other thing is that um, the management clusters, there's all kinds of failure modes, right? And it's not like a cluster is going to go away and like in Star Wars, like a million voices are going to be silenced all at once, right? It, it's going to be a node went down, node hardware failure, right? And in that case, having control planes running as pods is awesome, right? Because Kubernetes can just redeploy your control plane pods to another node and you're good. You don't, you don't have to do anything. Um, there's, of course, cases when your control plane can go down on the management cluster, right? But then you have to remember that your, your hosted control planes are workloads and those will keep on ticking even if your control plane is down. So you could take your time to restore your control plane and reconnect your nodes and it doesn't all have to die, right? So um, at least from my point of view, uh, is that you need to look at uh, disaster recovery as something you need to practice, plan for, but it's not something uh, that is scary or insurmountable. Yeah, you, you have to uh, apply all the best practices uh, for the infrastructure uh, level, so uh, yeah. like uh, availability zone, uh, backup, you mentioned backup, and so uh, that's and the only thing I would add, if anything, I think it's a benefit. And we've seen in client environments, um, disaster recovery on VM-based deployments take up to 30 days sometimes if it takes to ordering new machines. Um, you know, that sort of process, whereas with this process, you're up in the order of minutes, effectively, if you have the infrastructure available. So um, I would say that it's a net benefit in that regard. Yeah, I'd really like to em emphasize the part that, uh, you know, like Caesar said, your control planes are just as any workload in the cluster, which means that you can use existing tools like Velero to take a full backup for disaster recovery for your control planes. One particular kind of a thing that I've been, I've been hitting when, when testing disaster recovery is that the, the API endpoint is kind of hardwired into all of your worker nodes in Kubelet configuration, for example. And then if you have to do like really full disaster recovery, replacing the cluster with another, your API endpoint address might change. So you actually have quite a few places in different nodes and configurations where you have to go and change that. But you might probably be able to mitigate that with DNS, but well, DNS, what could possibly go wrong? It's always DNS. That's, that's the life of an engineer. Now, talking about best practice, it seems like, well, definitely disaster recovery is something that we need to enforce within our practice, daily practices, not only when we have something going down. And in addition to that, when it comes to best practices, is high availability and scalability. And here, I'd like perhaps have Adriano provide yeah. uh, So, having the, contr I with the control plane running as pod, as a regular workloads in a management cluster, you get out of the box all the capability of Kubernetes or the cloud native application managed by Kubernetes. So you get out of the box for free, high availability, uh, resiliency, uh, uh, reconciliation. So if something, if something is happens in your control plane, the Kubernetes uh, in the management cluster is able to reconcile and to recreate what you have before the disruption. So, uh, also the scalability, this is, you can scale your control plane uh, pods because they are regular pods managed by a deployment, so you can scale up, down, depending on the uh, loads, for example, or uh, depending on your needs. Uh, if you don't have to use the cluster, you can scale down all the, uh, the deployment, uh, scale to zero, and then uh, you can save resources because in this way you are not uh, allocating resources for a control plane that is not used. So you get out of box all the uh, capabilities that uh, Kubernetes already offer to you. So it's just. Uh, 
Cool. Anyone else on scalability, perhaps? I think we're good. So it seems like we can definitely leverage some of the best Kubernetes practices and functionalities when it comes to having pods and running pods. We have deployments. We have those automatic reconciliations as well. Now, another topic of interest when it comes to HCPs is, of course, security and compliance. How can we make our control plane secure and how this actually is addressed by hosted control planes? And Taylor, would you like to take this one? Yeah, and again, um, I just love the power that, you know, hosting on, as, on a Kubernetes native platform actually brings when you start to run these, um, especially, you know, in a multi-tenanted mode, um, in the isolation modes that you get there. So if you think at a high level, then um, just moving to running these as Kubernetes native deployments that you get, you get to enforce things like non-root deployments, right? You can have controllers that sit there and actually look at your control plane workload and will not allow that to run unless you're running in a least privileged sort of mode. You can pair that also with mandatory access controls. Think SE Linux, App Armor, to have an extra layer beyond the container itself isolation to where if there's a breakout, like, you know, a run C breakout that happened, I believe, a few years ago, it was proven that that actual block, right, since you have those mandatory access controls, you will not be able to get out of the file system that is scoped to just that control plane. So you have that isolation. Um, higher level, right, when you think about the networking isolation that you can do from control plane to control plane, now all of Kubernetes native um, network policies and the, the potentials of the um, additional capabilities that an SDN provider might provide you is all within your ballpark to do. And then of course you look at the um, auditability of that system now. Everything is declarative to the Kube API server. So you can really, in that management cluster, get a whole idea of every version, all the CVEs, um, you know, all the potential vulnerabilities that exist across your fleet, be able to pinpoint that down to individual instances and take action to remediate those based off of there. Whereas you're thinking on a large scale VMware, um, VM based deployment, you might be having to SSH into 5,000 nodes and look at version information of 10,000, um, you know, system D processes, just for example. So I think there's a lot of power um, in that notion as well. And uh, there is the potential to also use different topologies for your control plane workloads, say you want to isolate the control planes for, you know, different customers. Um, it is a matter of using Kubernetes, you know, node selectors, right? And, and putting things in, in uh, different, um, different nodes, that sort of thing. So uh, you do have a lot of power to isolate and separate these workloads. Yeah, this is more um, a perceived uh, threat than a real technical uh, issue. So one of the questions that uh, often we get is, uh, uh, is it possible that uh, a tenant is able to jump into the control plane, in the, uh, his own control plane, and then escape from the control plane and jump in the other control plane? Well, that's not possible because the control plane is uh, not accessible to the tenant class, or to the tenant user. So there is a, a isolation between the upper layer, the management layer, and the uh, uh, downstream layer where the tenants are uh, running their workloads. So the control plane is consumed as a service with, with just an IP address, a port, and a certificate. And so it is not uh, possible to jump into the control plane. Uh, so um, you can also uh, enforce some additional security. For example, you can run your control, the control planes in a kata container uh, uh, runtimes uh, to enf enforce what, you know, if you uh, protect the control plane, for example, with firewall or with the infrastructure itself, there is no risk to jump into the control plane. And so no risk to escape from the control plane itself. That's more a perceived uh, threat than a real uh, technical issue. 
one thing I, I, I'd like to add also for the security point of view is that, uh, like Clyde mentioned, security policies on network and whatnot. Uh, if you run your like traditional control planes on VMs or bare metal machines or whatever, you're always bound to define network policies with IP tables or firewalls or whatever. And, and, and there you have like different language for different setups and you have a handful of snowflakes at your hand. Here, what we can do is we can leverage the same language that we all know by heart, Kubernetes YAMLs for basically defining everything. Everything is YAML. Now, before we're going to open the floor for questions, um, we'd of course like to gauge your interest and perhaps participation in this initiative moving forward. And here I'd like to ask Taylor perhaps to showcase some of the future initiatives and any calls for action. Yeah, so um, um, what we recently started was actually a Slack channel. Um, and what we would love to see is, you know, folks that are interested and folks that are running this in production, what our goal is is to start to form a community and really start to take ideas from one another and sort of determine what are like these large scale best, best practices that we're all um, implementing, right? So right now um, we have a Slack channel open for that and we're looking at um, the proper forms for a more formal group there, whether that be, you know, a working group or a SIG, um, et cetera. We're sort of working through channels to get that established and we'll um, let that be known in the Slack channel. It's called hosted. Um, control planes in cloud native Slack, we'll share that as well. Um, but really looking to get best practices there. And then what we really wanna do is take that in a bunch of different directions. So one being right, um, we oftentimes see, you know, CIS, Kubernetes benchmarks. And all these benchmarks, these best practices are still applicable in control planes. But if you actually look at the controls that a lot of these systems are implementing, it's all VM-based um, scanning that they're trying to do, right? So it's SH into a VM and look at a file system and make sure it's 0644, you know, whatever it might be. Whereas if you're thinking about things now in a Kubernetes native environment, maybe it's instead I should be mounting my secrets as run mode 06 or 0400, uh, et cetera. So once we start to get these best practices and really get a community of a bunch of different, um, you know, organizations together, I think that'll give us a lot of power to be able to push some of these standards, um, you know, across the community and really make running these even more efficient at scale across the larger ecosystem of plugins and providers that are trying to come in and, you know, build on top of Kubernetes. Um, so that, that's definitely one thing that we're really excited about um, and uh, would love for your time and um, to hear your ideas from there. And also, like, like already mentioned, Basically, all of us are relying on same open source community components already without each other basically knowing us, knowing each other. So we definitely want to do more and more collaboration all over these common components and common goals and all that. Yeah, our, our job uh, should be also to educate to the control plane to this uh, new pattern. So. Uh, all the effort needs to be going this direction because it's it's something that is uh, uh, working, is uh, safe, is uh, it brings a lot of benefits that we discussed, and so. But we see that people sometimes are scared of this new design pattern, and so our efforts should be in this direction, even evangelize to. Uh, make sure that people uh, start to understand the, the, the model and uh, start to love the model as we do. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can say that just my brief experience here in the short time that I've talked to UC and Ad Adriano, well, I, I've worked with Tyler for a very long time, but my, my experience was that we have common problems that we're trying to solve, right? Like uh, we have very different implementations and I know we're not the only ones implementing uh, hosted control planes, right? So like uh, SAP Gardner has been doing this for a long time. Uh, there's, there's other people out there. So it'd be great if we could collaborate on solutions uh, to, 
you know, to, to uh, clap right. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's definitely a great point to kind of finish the panel. Um, if you'd like to get involved, definitely reach out to all of these people. You have their names on the, the schedule, of course. If you'd like to get involved more on a daily, daily basis, hopefully, um, do reach out on the Slack channel, which is hosted control planes, and it's going to be on the CNCF workspace. And I think we should have time for one question, one or two questions. So if you have any questions, please come forward and I'll give you the mic. And if not, that will weigh in the lobby just in case um, there's others that ask to, or I'll, I'll be there. Hey, thank you. My name is Vasu. I'm from the Gardner team. Thank you for the shout out. <laughs> okay, actually, I've got uh, three comments. Number one, the HCP model is actually not only for the con uh, Kubernetes control plane. Think about the Istio control plane if you want. If you want isolation, you can actually put that. Um, actually next to the, uh, in the same namespace of the controllers. Uh, then about backup, um, there was this question, uh, or the statement, you know, you can actually spread your high availability across multiple uh, management clusters um, and actually also pivot your control plane from one namespace in one management cluster to another, yeah? And one remark, uh, yes, we've been doing this since, I think we were in the, earliest cohort of um, doing HCP. And we have a project for you around etcd. There was an etcd operator, but we have a project called etcd druid, and it does actually most of our production work uh, and keeps it stable. So that's something where you can start off with. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Funny enough, I did talk with Vasu before, before the panel. He was mentioning we have more than 10,000 HCPs all around. I, I even lost the count of it, but apparently I'm not allowed to say that. Any other questions, perhaps? Yes. And the question to each of you, because if each of you has a different implementation of how that control planes, how do you handle, in practice, the persistence of those? Like running ACTD, doing backups, running a shared database, how are you doing that in practice? Yeah, I'm more than happy to take that. So, um, so if you sort of break down the different layers, what you see in practice is one of two things. So um, at an etcd layer, you can have multiple instances um, running local disk, right? Spread across machines where then if one fails, right, you have sort of an operator on the back end that then removes that out, adds a new member, and it's all local disk based. So you're truly playing like, you know, a game of two nodes going down, right? Recovery actions. Um, and things like that. There's another mode where um, at that persistence layer, you can use persistent volumes, right? So network attached storage um, within zones to ha still have that highly available, you know, MZR sort of architecture. Some of the hits that you take there, right, is if it's network-based storage, you might not get as many IOPS if you're truly using local disk. So that's one thing. The other piece is as far as persistence of the resources within the management cluster itself, you can actually have enforcement on, let's say if you're worried about someone going in and deleting a resource that's not supposed to be there. You can actually have, whether it's emission webhooks or whatever other parameters, RBAC, et cetera, that restricts even the operators of that management cluster, the operations that they can do. So maybe it's that an operator can actually never delete a cluster, right? That has to be actually initiated by a client it can only be driven by automated workload that's audited or anything like that with unique ID. So you can actually tie to the operators of that management cluster. You're not allowed to delete any deployments in here. You're allowed to do read some, you know, some read actions to help clients, you know, do whatever they might do. But that's sort of some of the controls um, on the deployment YAMLs themselves. I hope that answers your question. One, yes. one thing I'd like to add is that uh, for example, in, in our solution and in, in AWS team solution, uh, you can also point the control plane to a SQL database, for example, an RDS. So one worry less, at least a bit. Yeah, the external database, yeah? Yeah, external database. Yeah, yeah you can use, for example, a Postgres SQL. So it, it's specific of the implementation of the OSA control plane. So, but in our case, for example, you can use Postgres SQL to store uh, the, the the state of the Kubernetes, the downstream Kubernetes cluster. So 